Good evening and welcome. My name is Chase Rind and I have the honor of being the executive director here at the National Building Museum. And I'm delighted that you have all joined us for this truly special program this evening. As many of you know, the National Building Museum is a private nonprofit educational and cultural organization that was chartered by an act of Congress. For nearly 30 years, the museum has led the exploration of and public conversation about the importance and significance of the built environment. Our exhibitions, our family, youth, and outreach programs, and our special programs like tonight's, illustrate the relevance of architecture, landscape architecture, engineering, planning, and design in our everyday lives. This evening, we celebrate the career of a longtime friend of the museum. David M. Schwartz served as a museum trustee from 1996 to, to 2002, and during his tenure, he was the leading force behind the establishment of our prestigious Vincent Scully Prize. David is one of Washington's most prominent architects. He serves as president and CEO of David M. Schwartz Architects, a firm that has earned many accolades for its civic, commercial, and institutional projects. 2008 marks the 30th anniversary of his firm, and the museum is honored to help kick off a weekend celebrating David's remarkable achievements and those of his firm. Tonight's panel discussion will explore the critical collaborative process between client and architect that has resulted in so many successful and significant projects for David. In addition to David, we are pleased to welcome Edward Perry Bass, Chairman of the Performing Arts Center in Fort Worth, and Gary Hansen, Executive Director of the Cleveland Orchestra. Introducing the panelists more fully will be this evening's moderator. Paul Goldberger is the architecture critic for The New Yorker, authoring the Skyline column. He also holds the Joseph Urban Chair in Design and Architecture at the New School in New York City, and he was formerly Dean of Parsons School of Design. He began his career at the New York Times, where in 1984, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Criticism. Paul is the author of a number of books, including Up From Zero, Politics, Architecture, and the Rebuilding of New York, which chronicles the rebuilding of Ground Zero. He has also written The City Observed, New York, The Skyscraper, on the Rise, Architecture and Design in a Postmodern Age, Above New York, and The World Trade Center Remembered. Paul lectures widely around the country on the subjects of architecture, design, historic preservation, and cities, and he has taught at both the Yale School of Architecture and the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California, Berkeley. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Goldberger. Thank you very much, Chase. It's a great pleasure to, to be here uh, in this uh, one of David Schwartz's best works, I must say. Um, actually, it is, it is wonderful to mark the occasion of 30 years of practice by David and his colleagues. Uh, as you may know, it's, this anniversary is being marked also with the publication of a new monograph, David Schwartz Architects, which includes his work over the past five years. It's a companion volume to the earlier David M. Schwartz, a monograph that covered the first 25 years of his practice. I'm not entirely sure what it means that they're about the same thickness, um, because in fact, David has been pretty productive all along. Um, actually, what the new, new book does do is present recent projects in more detail, which is quite welcome. Uh, otherwise, I would have to say, after now looking at both, that it isn't terribly different in format, uh, although I'm afraid I do have to say that the jacket photographs of David in each book do reveal that a little bit of time has passed. <laughs> but anyway, the um, new book also includes a very welcome essay by David himself, who stayed more in the background in the first book, 
and happily this time has chosen to say something about the premises that underlie his work, and we'll talk about all that in the next few minutes. It may be the only essay ever written that includes the two names, Rainer Banham and Jane Mansfield, in adjacent paragraphs, but it is a wonderful piece of self-reflection, which I think architects often do not do often enough. In any event, uh, 30 years is, by many standards, an entire career. If it's not long when compared, say, to Frank Lloyd Wright, who practiced for 70 years, it's still enough time to produce a very significant body of work. Eero Saarinen's active career, the period when he was producing important buildings on his own and not as his father's partner, lasted only a little more than a dozen years. Louis Kahn's first major building was built only 25 years before his career came to an end. So 30 years is not at all too soon to pause and take account of where you are. And David Schwartz, I think, is in a particularly interesting place with an exceptionally accomplished and diverse practice, a notable body of work, and a particular disinclination to be ideological. His architecture is conservative by some standards, but not dogmatically so. He's not one of those architects who designs traditional buildings because he believes that modernism is an invention of the devil. In fact, my sense is that he is quite content to live in the 21st century. His architecture takes the form it does, at least it seems to me, largely because he's primarily interested in two things. Urbanism, which is to say the urban fabric, the street, the idea of context, and the connection between a client's private wishes and his civic responsibility. David operates, it seems to me, on the premise that every building has a civic responsibility and the users are not only the people who write checks to pay for it. Thus, a children's hospital is designed with the patients in mind, a performing arts center from the standpoint of the audience, a baseball park to make the experience appealing for the fans, and so forth. Now, looking at a building this way is a way of expressing civic responsibility, and I suppose to tie up this, these brief opening thoughts, civic responsibility, if we're looking for a theme that ties all of David's work together, is probably it. In the next few minutes, we'll talk in more detail about this, since our theme tonight of this conversation is not so much architecture itself, although I'm sure we'll say plenty about that, but something that's necessary as a precondition to architecture, which is the collaboration between architects and clients. David has had several very long-term clients, and we'll talk about that and about other things in the relationship between clients and architects. David, I think most of you in this room probably know, I don't think anybody in Washington does not know him. Um, to my immediate left is Ed Bass, who has almost single-handedly revived downtown Fort Worth and has had David as his architectural partner for most of that journey, designing projects ranging from the extraordinary and expansive Nancy Lee and Perry R. Bass Performance Hall to retail complexes at Sundance Square, to an apartment block, to a hospital. And Gary Hansen, executive director of the Cleveland Orchestra, is at your far right, which commissioned David to restore and expand Severance Hall. Let me welcome all three of you. Our goal, as I said, was to make this as much of a true conversation as possible, so let's move right into it. Um, Ed, if I could start with you and just ask, what, what were you after in Fort Worth? What led you to David? Why was he the right architect 
for such a diverse group of projects. You know, usually somebody who's right for a hospital is not right for a stadium and so forth. What, what is it about David that made you think, uh, let's say that like Michael Phelps, he could star in every event? I mean, what, what? Okay. Uh, well, for, Paul, I will tell you it was not a studied architectural selection process, okay. as, yeah. as I know from many institutions and have been through right. many times. Uh, there's an interesting story to go with that because the revitalization of downtown Fort Worth really started uh, conceptually, the effort started in the late 70s. And by, um, uh, by 1982-83, uh, three new, four new massive high-rise, 40-story uh, plus office towers had been built. Uh, turn of the century buildings had been restored, streetscapes had been landscaped, and, and there was a huge effort had uh, gone in, all fueled by the oil boom of the early 80s. Uh, and uh, I, had, I had become involved because my older brother had invested uh, ourselves, our family company, into these, these efforts. In, the, uh, in, in about 1985, I came to Washington, and I, I, a city I knew well and once lived in, hadn't been here in many years, and as we traveled, as I went to an appointment on Connecticut Avenue, just above DuPont Circle, I came out and I saw a fascinating building up the street. And I said, I gotta look closer at this building. And it was a brick building and it had a tower and a arch reminiscent of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and, and so forth. And I said, this is an amazing building. This really resonates with me. And uh, so I went in and asked the store clerk, do you know who the architect might have been that did this? And she said, oh yeah, people ask all the time. And she opened the cash register and picked up the cash thing and took out and said, David Schwartz. And I said, I met him. He's doing work for my brother in Fort Worth. Uh, not designing buildings, but on a federal court case trying to influence the highway department. He was a historic consultant. Later that afternoon, we're driving in this, where Rock Creek Parkway meets the freeways, and I look up the bank, and there's a brick building, or actually several big buildings with scaffolds, a few scaffolds still around them, but obviously. And I said, now that's another cool building. Boy, what they're doing in Washington, I really like. Uh, so I told David about discovering what's known as the Cuckoo Clock building and said, I know this, other, I saw this other building that was really cool too, David. And he said, oh yeah, that's the Griffin. We did that too. So here I was in the city of Washington, discovered two buildings. I said, David, uh, I'm working on a project. Let's, let's work together. And that's how the selection. So I have to say that it was a personal resonance that got me involved but it was the experience of working together and the way that David approaches things that got me hooked. Uh, our, first, uh, our, our first project, which we worked on for three years before we put, I'm trying to think what on the carved in the stone, uh, 1990 or something like that carved in the stone. Uh, so it's, it's, been a, it's been a 20 year process. Two-thirds of your career, David. Whenever that, that building was um, uh, whenever Ann Richards became governor. So that's the way that we can Did date you that date building. Your building by Texas administration? Is that no, I date my life by my buildings. Oh, I right, just right. happen to remember. <laughs> I'll tell you one of my favorite anecdotal stories. Um, this was a building that opened, and the reason I happen to remember this is Ed's date for the opening was Ann Richards. Ah. And um, Ed's assistant, Jeannie, tells a great story of the governor's uh, um, assistant calling Ed up and saying, what's Mr. Bass wearing to the opening? And, uh, no, excuse me, Jeannie called um, the governor and said, what's the governor wearing to the opening? Ed wants to dress appropriately. And um, so the assistant to the governor says, well, I'll ask the governor. And this questioning back and forth about what people are going to wear goes on for about six weeks. <laughs> and so... Jeannie then calls again and says, Ed really needs to know because he really wants to address appropriately for whatever the governor is going to wear. Is it long? Is it short? 
And so the governor's assistant finally says, I'll tell you what, Mr. Bass, the governor comes two ways, five pounds of beads or 10 pounds of beads. <laughs> Take your choice. <laughs> I never heard whether he chose five or 10 pounds of beads, but <clears throat> it's a very Ann Richards story. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. Um, but I love the fact that, Ed, you really came to David, we could say, in the sort of most most honorable way, which is through his buildings, not because you'd heard his name or did a conventional search process, but because you actually encountered a building and liked it. Yes, though I Which, had met him, and right, he, okay. he mm -hmm. was that somewhat odd guy that, that wore sandals to the, to the, along with his suit and tie. People in Texas don't wear sandals. So. <laughs> no. right, right. Yes, I think Ed is actually wearing boots. You're wearing sandals. So, so those, you, you average out to shoes, and, I guess. And, and, <laughs> no, no. Gary is wearing shoes, and he's from Cleveland. Right. So this does tell you something about all three right, of us. Right, and, right, right, right. So, Gary. And Tell, Paul, yes, I liked but, your socks. Oh, thank, thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, you all knew you were coming to now, a really now, intellectual evening, right? Okay. Back to architecture. Um, Gary, tell us, uh, how did you come to David? David came to me. Ah, uh, okay. Well, um, I somehow ended up as the, as the manager of the Severance Hall renovation when it was originally conceived in the mid-1990s. And with the guidance of one of the great cost consultants in the world, Stuart Donnell, who's here, we created a long list of architects, and then we narrowed it down to a short list of architects. The short list showed up one by one to meet with me and the building manager who worked for me. And the three architects on the short list, uh, there were two others plus David, and David walked into my office and was the least pleasant and the least engaging and, and uh, was, was clearly unhappy to be there. And he was clearly, he was clearly unhappy to be meeting with me. No, because David, David why. I, I, I'll, I'll get to that. He was clearly unhappy to be meeting with me. He was expecting to be meeting with the board president and the major donor and so on and so forth. And the title on my card at the time was marketing director, <laughs> which I was. But I also had responsibility for our public spaces and our, all of our facilities which actually was a nice interface with David because from David's standpoint, buildings are as much about the people as they are about the architecture. It didn't take us long, it probably took us about an hour to figure out that each of us was a worthy representative for our particular, our particular calling. Um, and after that first meeting, I was, I was a quiet advocate in the background to make sure that the selection process yielded the right results. And when we go a little further into this discussion, when we actually start talking about clients, I have a couple of things I want to say about selection processes and the difficulty of having amateurs choose professionals. But before I do that, one of the things that is important to me about buildings as I'm in the music business is acoustics. And if the sound engineer back there is listening, it would be really great if we could get a little sound out of the, the platform monitors because I'm, I can tell that everybody out there can hear what everybody's saying, but we can't hear on the stage. So there are monitors here, but they're not it's, on. It's a particular challenge for me because I sort of You need to hear what here, we're saying. Right, exa exa exactly. But um, this, this room, for all its glory, was not designed particularly with, let, let us say it's not as purpose built for this as Severance Hall is for orchestras. Exactly so, right. But I would yes. say, Paul, you, you told us beforehand mm -hmm. that you wanted this to be a conversation right. as if it were in David's living room. Well, I will tell you, David's living room does not echo like <laughs> this. But David did look up ambitiously and longingly thinking, well, gee, if my living room only were like this, maybe my next house. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Anyway. Um, design directions for the various things you've done together. Um, were they set by David? Were they set by you guys as clients? Or do you feel you came to them together? Um, obviously, a, there was a certain general predisposition or you would not have hired David. But more specifically than that, uh, can you recall how much uh, you as clients 
had input into the design process and in, in the how case, much David did? In, in the case of, of Gary, yeah. the people who were the design inspiration. David, talk a little louder, please, I think. Um, in the case of Gary, the design inspiration was long since dead. Um, right. It was Walker and Weeks, the original architect of the building. Um, and I think that one of the reasons that Gary and I decided we liked each other is we both believed that the project wasn't about the Cleveland Orchestra, per se, and not about my views about architecture, but rather about Walker and Weeks. In other um, words, about this historic building. Right. And restoring it, expanding it, but being true to whatever it was originally. As, and as many of my clients say, when we're negotiating fee, Gary said to me, well, David, this building is going to make your career, and which is, which is always what they say when they want to pay less. Right, right, right. And <laughs> I, I, I said to him, no, Gary, if I do my job well, nobody will ever know I was here. They will simply think it's part of the original building. Um, he upped his fee a little at that point, but not much. <laughs> That's what, Gary? Yeah. Um, let me talk about design direction a little sure. bit, but I'm going to recall one thing that you said at the very beginning of the project that was a real surprise to me, but I have since learned is very important. You said that design is only 5% of the architectural work. And most of us think that architects are these great visionary thinkers, and most of what they do is come up with wonderful designs. What I learned in working with you and with the fabulous people in your office is how much real real serious work that is not about grand design goes into it. And to that point, there, there was an extraordinary amount of interaction between, between me and my colleagues in the orchestra as, as clients and you and your colleagues in the firm as architects because you wanted to know exactly how we used each room, each space, each passageway. and. That actually, that actually is part of the design direction that isn't really the decoration, it isn't really the grand vision. But if you want to have a great building when you're done, all of those details are important. You're at, you're, you could not be more right, actually. You know, I've often felt that there should be a huge sign. Like, do you remember that line from the um, Clinton campaign in 1992, it's the economy, stupid, that in architects' offices that says, it's the program, stupid. <laughs> because under, understanding the program is so often, uh, or failure to understand the program is so often where architecture goes off the rails. Not the, the other really wonderful thing about working with Gary, and this is an absolute opposite between Gary and Ed, um, Gary came to the um, uh, project thinking he knew everything he needed to know to build a building. And, you know, he'd renovated a house. What more did you need to know? <laughs> um, and he learned very, very quickly that renovating a house and renovating a concert hall were somewhat different, um, and that the training of renovating a house was not sufficient, and we've always said the best. Because I, I don't know, I've never been to Gary's house. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. we, we've always said the best clients are the best students, and, mm -hmm. and Gary learned very quickly he needed to be a student. On the other hand, Ed has architectural training, and unlike Gary, he came to all of our projects thinking he knew nothing. Um, even though he was fairly well educated in the field of architecture. And I think Ed understood in the beginning that the best client and the best architect are the best students. And so what was interesting is, is, is as first experiences is, here's the person with no training who had to learn they didn't know anything, and here's the person with great training who came to building buildings with a great deal of humility. Um, and it's, it's been a very interesting to, to, to build for them both. That's actually a, a good way back to the first question, which we never fully got to, Ed, which was uh, how your comfort level with David doing so many diverse kinds of projects. Um, the buildings you saw in Washington that excited you were not concert halls or baseball parks or, well, you didn't do the baseball park, but concert halls or um, other things programmatically like so many of the other things. What gave you the sense that, in fact, you could learn together with David to pick up on his phrase. Well, but they were urban. Yeah, okay. And Washington has a wonderful urban character, uh, perhaps, perhaps unique in the mm -hmm. United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very much something I think we wanted to instill 
in in uh, downtown mm -hmm. Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. But but as I began to to work with David, David I I learned a great deal about about uh, the process, uh, and I for which I thank David and I thank another person here, Vicki Dickerson, who's our project manager on everything I've ever built. Uh, so so between the two of them, there, there's mm -hmm. been great success. But, but you know, David told me something early on when we were just getting to know each other. Uh, he said, you know, we are client or very much client-oriented architects. And I thought, I rolled my eyeballs and thought, yeah, they all, all, say that. all <laughs> architects tell all clients that, you know, okay, we'll get past. I didn't understand what he meant. David can't work without intense involvement mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the client, of the owner. And it's very, very much a collaborative process. And it's not just the owner and the architects. It's the contractors, the project management. And you've got to reach out to all the user groups. And mm -hmm. with a performing arts hall, it's not just the audience. It's the people that have to run the building, and it's the stage crews, and it's the, or, the be it orchestras or the performing companies mm -hmm. of whatever sort. And it's the donors have to be happy with it. And the people that drive by are important. And all of these people must be brought into the collaborative process one way or another. It's also an incredibly iterative process. You never stop. One thing great about David, uh, where most architects, other architects, I won't say most, but I've had experience with our other architects who two-thirds of the way through mm -hmm. building the building, you've seen them for the last time. They really disappear. They're on their next projects. With David, six months after you finish the building, he still is coming back trying to get the little things right that just you know, the oversights or the unfinished pieces or whatever. I should still tell you I haven't been able to get them to change the signage over the bars in Bass Hall, though I've been trying for 10 years We now. just had our 10th anniversary and he's still coming back. So. <laughs> and, that, and that aspect of the process, so no one decides, mm -hmm. but together mm -hmm. that collaborative process decides. David himself has, uh, that, that it is really a process of discovery. You work together and as you go through, you're continually discovering things that contribute to what the building uh, is, is going to be, the direction it takes and, and so forth. So with David, you never get uh, one solution. David comes with three, four, five, really all of them well thought out and often ingenious and wonderful solutions to any particular aspect or problem. Mm -hmm. And then you work with them and you work with them and you kind of say, okay, well, a little of this and a little of that mix and match. And you expect him to then come back and have it drawn up. No, he, he then takes that and comes back with three more. Mm -hmm. So when he means that they are client uh, uh, oriented, he means he expects the client he needs the client to work every bit as hard as he and his and his people do, and that's that's the fun and the magic uh, of of working in this collaboration. No, that that's great, David. Um, when you come to a client with multiple solutions, uh, do you often have one that you prefer, and if so, do you kind of try to subtly push them in that direction or not? Um, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gary, that's. Gary, that's but, a, but I have an insight before David okay. answers that. Mm -hmm. I've learned, Vicki and I have learned, to always try to tell David, make David tell us which one he prefers first, because I'm otherwise convinced that whichever one I might pick, he picks another one in order to stimulate the debate. <laughs> so. but, but I have to comment on, on Gary's fly, right? Yeah. I have to comment on Gary's comment because that's the nicest thing he's ever said to me. <laughs> no, it's ne not. He's never said there's anything subtle about me before in the past. <laughs> um, the, the, we never present anything we don't like. Um, and do I generally have a preference? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, I had generally thought I'm pretty direct about it. Um, we generally try and present everything neutrally. 
um, because we don't want to steer the client. Um, but I'm perfectly happy to which, admit which ones I like best. Well, b building a building and designing a building is always a question of approximation and triangulation. There isn't a right answer. And the reason that our process is what it is and the reason we iterate the way we do is it's a triangulation on what the client wants. So that when we present five options, as, as Ed says, what we first get out of that is some notion of the direction the client wants. So we take those off the table and then we take the one or two that they like and we iterate them again to, again, get a greater triangulation. And as we get greater certainty and greater understanding, of what it is that the client wants the building to be as reflected in what we want it to be, then we don't necessarily have as many options. But right. people generally don't know what they want, and if they do know what they want, they can't articulate it. Um, one of the things our clients say to us most frequently is, I don't know what I want, but I'll know it when I see it. That's not overly helpful. Right. Um, and so what we've d done is to develop a process to not have to ask them that question in those words. Um, and while they say things like that, clients always know what they don't want. Yeah. Um, and they can be much more articulate about what they don't want than they can about what they want. And so our process is really involved in trying to understand from our point of view and the things we find acceptable, what it is the client is looking for. How do you get, how do you deal with, let's say, a not particularly articulate client or not particularly visually sophisticated client um, to how do you how, what is the process by which you get them to begin to focus on and articulate what they actually do want uh, every client is articulate in some fashion okay um, and it's the architect's job to figure out in what fashion the architect mm -hmm. is articulate um, and it changes from client to client we're in the middle of doing a performing arts facility in Las Vegas at the moment um, and the 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 job that was given to us by the client was to create something that feels authentic, Las Vegas, and indigenous. Now, that, that, that's a tall order. Um, and a great deal of conversation, particularly in Las Vegas, what's indigenous? Um, and we spent a great deal of time talking to our client, trying to understand what that meant to him. You know, the Opera Garnier already exists in Las Vegas. You right, can't right, build right. another You've one. Right, got one already right. at, the, at the hotel. Yeah, exactly. um, mm -hmm. And uh, it exists in one hotel in its exterior and another hotel in its interior. They didn't get it in the same building, but they're both there. Um, and I think in large measure, as I say, I think that every, every client is articulate. It's just learning their language. Um, and I think a lot of architects think it is the client's job to understand the language of the architect. Um, I think we firmly believe that it's the architect's job to learn the language of the client. But also, but as you said earlier, that sort of to educate each other in a way. Well, I, mean, I, I think that. learning to speak together has nothing to do with educating each other. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the things we do when we do a concert hall is we try and take um, our concert hall clients to look at different concert halls and it's to develop a common language. That's sure. the whole point of it. Mm -hmm. It's to develop a common language. We, we, we all use words. And we far too frequently don't understand that we mean different things by the same words. Um, and I think learning to talk to each other, well, I mean, I hate getting to know new people. Um, I'm very shy. One of the reasons I particularly treasure Ed and sometimes eschew Gary is Gary's not building any more concert halls, but Ed's building lots more buildings. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Ed and I understand each other perfectly at this point. If Ed says something, I know what he means. If I say something, he knows what I mean. And in meetings, we're often very frustrating to people who are in the meetings with us because we can get really irritated with each other for no apparent reason. Mm -hmm. But I know the next thing he's going to say, and he knows the next thing I'm going to say, and we already disagree. <laughs> um, and so the, the, the learning how to understand a client, learning how to talk to a client, and I think in a lot of the ways, one of the reasons that we have so many long-term clients is we're totally committed to the notion that learning to talk to each other is the first step in creating a great building. Um, and I think that the, the very act of learning to talk to each other is central and critical to solving architectural problems. Now, this sort of underscores a sense that I've always had that every architect to do his job right has to be part therapist, I suppose, right, or part psychoanalyst, um, in that you, you really do need to be able to communicate comfort, comfortably. Um, I think you could argue that yeah. that's, I think you could argue that that's also true of a great client. 
mm -hmm. has to be part therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Not just with the architects and the consultants, but also with the rest of the client group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm coming to understand about architecture is that there aren't very many great buildings that didn't have a great client. Right, that's absolutely totally right. True. Yeah. Totally true. And that they also had great architects, and it's actually the meeting of the client and the architect that creates a great building, because the client has to have some idea as to what is supposed to come out, and right. also has to be a part of this business of developing a language. But in particular, with all of the rest of the people in the client group, and in particular, when it's an institutional building, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to a commercial building. I don't think any architect does his best work on a blank slate with no constraints, no limits, no anything. It is, it is the connection, the intersection between limits and, and reality and conceptual ideas that where it all happens, no? In yeah, fact, an yeah. interesting observation there, mm -hmm. uh, interesting observation of uh, really successful, prominent architects uh, who quite often become, you know, re relatively well-to-do is uh, the number that live in homes where they took a building and remodeled it for their purpose. Very, very few of those architects seem to build themselves a house from scratch. And when you think of it, because then there are no constraints. Right, right. And a good architect's career is made of working well with constraints. So if you've already got a house and you've got to make it fit you, uh, that's a perfect job for an architect. Right. Actually, you make me think of that old uh, line about, you know, only a fool has himself for a lawyer. I wonder, <laughs> only a fool has himself for an architect, perhaps. I don't, I don't know. But you're absolutely right. And I think the, the only, there are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, but only, I mean, Philip Johnson's glass house, I suppose, is an exception. That, that was really his best work. Totally different. I think. But totally, totally different totally situation. Different. And, it was like, and, that was right. like writing a book. Yes, yes exactly. It's his autobiography, really. Yes. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> and Sir John Soane's museum is also a kind of autobiography, really. But, but you're absolutely right. And, and uh, many, uh, almost no architects live in houses. And, and no one done. would yeah. say that Taliesin is one of Wright's better buildings. That's right. It's not. Um, but the program, the program for which was not a house to live in. Oh, yes, it was he, an he, educational institution. No, I, I think, both. I think he, both, both. I, I, yeah. I, I think right, he really right. viewed it as a house with lots of servants. Right. Yes. <laughs> Who were called apprentices. Right. As I said, a house with lots right, of right, servants. Exactly. Exactly. Right. 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 Um, <laughs> let me ask. Uh, since, as we've been sort of getting at, uh, client-architect relationship is often, is certainly close, and has some resemblances even to a marriage in the long nature of it, the long-term nature of it, and the importance of communication. Um, there's never been a marriage in history that hasn't had some strains. So let's talk for a moment about what were the issues of tension uh, between you, David, and either of these clients, um, at various points over the period that you I, were working together. I think in the case of Gary, it was really growing. It's interesting, Gary talked earlier about the role of the project person on the, on the institutional side mm -hmm. of having to orchestrate the, his client group. And I think one of my struggles in, in learning to work with Gary was to learn to trust him to deal with his board. Um, mm -hmm because he had a, a very specific way of, of doing it, and frequently he didn't want me any nearby, anywhere nearby when he did. That made me very nervous because here was a non-professional presenting architectural ideas, and how could they do it without me? I mean, you know, really. Um, and th we did have tension and conflict over that. Um, I think the other area that we had tension and conflict in the beginning was in defining the problem because Gary had, when I first met him, defined what I considered to be the wrong problem and asked the wrong question um, um, and had the wrong budget, which is just as central to everything as, as anything else. Um, and I think until he understood why I thought he had asked the wrong question and had solved the wrong problem, there was some level of tension between us. 
And then there was the issue of the sandals. <laughs> <laughs> I made David wear shoes when he came to meetings in Cleveland. I, I, I will tell you that the, the, the Bass family is very close. Um, and recently Ed's father died, which was for lots of reasons a great tragedy. The only reason that it was not a great tragedy is Perry Bass said, you're not to wear sandals in any of my buildings. So that while I was very sad about Perry's passing, I was very relieved that I could finally you wear sandals again. You to wear sandals? Sort of, yeah. But, yeah. but my, father did, my father did say that in a, in a very subtle but effective way. Uh, when David first started showing up, he, my father just referred to him as sandals. Oh, there's sandals again. What's sandals doing here now? And uh, he, he didn't never learned his name. He just called him sandals, which kind of shamed shamed David. Sandals. And David, mm -hmm. David in Fort Worth wears boots. Yeah, I do wear cowboy ah. boots. That's true. <laughs> okay. I do believe in a pro. Uh, just as it, I believe when in, in when in Rome. No, as I believe in contextual buildings, I believe in contextual <laughs> wardrobe. Right. right. Okay. I, absolutely. I, I, I like that. And mm -hmm. and you know, it's interesting. I I think that that if there's any tension between Ed and myself, and I think it's rare, it is that we both um, know what the other person's going to say next. Right. And so when we react to it before they've said it, you know, we each get upset with each other at times. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the, one of the things I say to all of my people who ask me how to choose your architect, I say choose the person you like best first, think is most talented second, and are most prepared to fight with and make up with. Right. Because any good relationship exactly. between an architect and a client is going to have disagreements. Um, and you need to know that they're going to occur, and you need to know that you have enough respect for the client and they have enough respect for you so that once the disagreement is complete, the differences are put aside and no one is terminally offended. Right, I think that's exactly right. I mean, you need to have a comfort level sufficient right. so that you can vent a little bit and then comfortably come back together again. And, and we do do that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's interesting because when we did Bass Hall, and, and this is a story I love telling because I think it speaks so well of, of Ed, um, Ed and I disagreed as to what building to build. Um, and Ed had always envisioned Bass Hall as being a brick building that was indigenous to Fort Worth's mm -hmm. brick history. Um, and I was much more interested in doing what I considered to be a landmark because very few buildings deserve to be landmark buildings, but one of the ones that does is certainly a concert hall. And we designed the building that, that currently exists, and we presented them both to Ed, and he said, well, you know, I prefer the brick one, but and I said, well, I prefer the one with the angels. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, and um, I'll let you design them both. I won't pay you anymore, but I will let you design them both. And if you really believe that strongly, I will take it to the board and not tell them which one I think, which one I prefer, and let them vote. Um, and what he did was he presented both schemes in a totally equal-handed nature, didn't participate in the conversation, let them vote, and I'm happy they chose the one that I liked. I don't know whether he's ever regretted it or not, but... Um, That's but, extraordinary. Yeah. I, I, so in other words, you carried the two options all the way through the design process, really. Through, through the end of schematic design, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. We did. To, to the extent that you had each facade rendered. Right. The plan was yeah. the same. In, the the plan and then was, actually when I went to mm -hmm. the board, all the women said that one, and all the men said, must be right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, but you know, at, in, the, in that relationship, I want to make a distinction. Uh, I really prize that, that in our architectural sessions, mm -hmm. we can really so intensely debate. Because debating right. is a high art and very productive and, and is a wonderful thing. But we don't argue about things, we debate them. And some people that are unfamiliar with the process will come in and they get very uncomfortable. Some, it, it can get very heated, these debates, and they don't understand that we're, we're pursuing the issues and you have to build an intensity sometimes right. to figure out uh, where, you know, where things are at with these issues. And, and from time to time, you know, one of us will quip and kind of put the other one down. And, and sometimes I looked in retrospect and I say, gosh, I, 
I was probably very rude right there. But it all, get, it all seems to flow in the process of the debate. And that's a valuable thing, and I think it takes a long relationship or a very productive relationship to be able to build that intensity, because that is productive. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. David, were you going to say something? Well, the first project we did for Ed was in 1985, so we've actually worked for them for 23 years, um, and which is more than two-thirds of my career at this right. point. Um, and I think really what, what is, is singular about both Ed and Gary is they want to build the best building they can build. Um, we recently are, were in the process of finishing an office building for, for, in Fort Worth for, for Ed at the moment. And when it started out, he had a very, very clear idea on what he wanted to build. Um, I had a very clear idea on the fact that that's not what I wanted to build. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, the building we're building is unusual because of it's an unusual height in Fort Worth. And the context for it in terms of its height is an unusual building. It's called, Black, well, it used to be called the Blackstone Hotel. And Ed wanted to build a fairly rectangular building, and I wanted to build a building with a more elaborate top. Um, and there was a dialogue about this for quite some period of time and a debate. Um, and we went through it for quite a while and we had needed to save some money on the project before the price of energy went up and um, Fort Worth the real estate market became zero um, vacancy. Um, and as we went through the process we did to pay for some of what I wanted to do, we made what is sort of the back of the building less expensive. And as the building neared near the top of its being built, Ed was walking around downtown at one point. He said, well, you know, we really should, shouldn't do it that way. We really probably should make the back of the building as nice as the front, because you can see it from everywhere from the south. Um, and th that was a wonderful thing for me, because if I had said it, everybody would have yelled at me. But when the client says, we need to build this better, everyone applauds it. And that's one of the great differences between being the client and the architect. I mean, again, I think Gary was very, very good at, at, at trying to make Severance Hall um, as good as it could be and really did look at, at, at all of the issues and all of the places from which it's built. And I think one of the most important things for any architect is that his client wants to build as good a building as he could build, can build as well as the, that we do. Sure. The client, the client has to watch the budget, though. And as you're talking, I was thinking, you know, it sounds like David has won every argument. <laughs> I assure you that's not true. And so I was trying to think of which arguments in Severance Hall you didn't win, and I can actually think of a lot of them. They're all fairly small. The double doors from the boardroom to the donor dining room. You lost that one. Um, a David, few other. David, was David for or against the double doors? He wanted the double doors. The double doors were not original. Okay. It's not still right. a single door, and it It's works. very small. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing you need to know is that David, David never gives up. <laughs> that is also true. But the building does have to get built. Um, on the subject of, of uh, debate, I actually would elevate the word debate into conflict. <laughs> and, but one of the things I learned in the, in, the, in the process of building Severance Hall that has been very valuable in everything else I do is the value of productive conflict, conflict which is not personal. Because surfacing conflict and resolving conflict and doing it quickly actually gets a better result. And so you come to the table, you have a disagreement, you you, you, and I, I'm, I'm sure I can hear you guys arguing, actually. But, um, and Ed, you just said, you, you say to yourself, maybe some other, somebody else in the room might think I was a little rude. But that's actually the process of getting the job done. And David, I've worked with one other architectural firm on another major project, and you're much better at fighting than, <laughs> than, in, my other, than in my other experience. But it seems to me, if I, if, uh, from what I'm hearing, that if D David's fighting, but he's fighting with a sort of pleasure and expectation that you're on the same level, you're as opposed to an architect pro proclaiming like Zeus from above. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. and that makes the nature of the argument very different. I well, the think. trick is yeah. that, that if the client and the architect are both fighting for the building, or if they're both fighting for the people who are going to use the building, then you're actually going to come closer to the right resolution than if you're fighting for your own idea or your own ego or right, whatever. Right. And I think that you, you have a unique ability in the architectural field, perhaps, to do that. One of the, the most important fight that Gary and I had during the whole time we were working on Severance Hall 
was um, Gary decided he was going to cater our luncheons out of the Severance Hall kitchen. And the food was, to put it mildly, awful. Um, and so I said to Gary at a point, the quality of the meeting equals the quality of the food. And he didn't believe me. And so for a couple month period, no, this is true, he served us bad meals and good meals and so what kind of meetings he had. And I have to admit, I was a big man. He came to me after a period of experimentation. Weeks. It took weeks. Only well, weeks. It, to my mind, it was a series of very bad lunches. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some good ones. And he said to me, you know, David, you're right. The quality of the meeting equals the quality of the food. And we ate very well after that. And that was, a, that was an important conflict that we had. We did eat well. As long as it's not an inverse proportion to the quality of the food. No, it's not inverse. Right. No, it's, uh, everybody's happier if you right. give them good food. Right. Good. Is good. that in your book? No, I don't think that is in my That'll book. That'll be in the third volume. I, 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 I will tell <laughs> you, I'm teaching a studio at Yale this, this semester. And some of my students are here. And one of the things I did at our first studio was I came into class and I brought some food. And I said, I'm going to teach you the most important le lesson about being a successful architect. That if you want to have a good meeting and you want to have a happy client, give them good food. Feed your clients. And yes, right. so I gave them food. And I've made one of them in charge of supplying food for each of our studios. Um, and there is a pedagogical reason here. I'm trying to teach them that this is in fact a truism, that people are much happier when they have something good to eat. And that's why we've tried to give you something to eat beforehand so that you'd be happy and feel good about this event. That is Schwartz's first law of client care? Yes. Is give them food. Give them, okay. give them right. food and give them good food. Right, right, right. Let, let, let's talk for a moment um, about, get a little bit back to architecture itself, uh, rather than the issue of client relationships and about the role of traditional architecture today. You know, David, I was struck by the extent in your preface to the new book that you talked about it not in stylistic terms, but as something that emerged out of a sense of conservation, out of a sense of the urban fabric and historic preservation and so forth. And I was also very taken by um, a line, and I'll quote you here, uh, in which you described your objectives as, and I quote, we have always wanted to make places that feel good rather than think good. We have always believed in an emotional rather than an intellectual attachment to a place. And that's a tremendously important comment, actually. I, I think maybe we could explore it for a little while. Um, the first question that it brings to mind is, do you think modernism in fact, denied emotional attachments or made them impossible or? Well, um, I mm -hmm. think it depends. Modernism is not a monolithic style. Right. And right. I, I think it's important. I mean, I think we tend to um, lump all of modernism into one group of buildings. It's also important to understand that modernism is now a complete style. Mm -hmm. And while we have modernist revival buildings, right. what we know as modernism ended sometime in the 60s or 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and after it came postmodernist and the blobists and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do I think that architecture, post-World War II architecture, can deny emotional attachment? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think buildings that don't allow for a human being to relate to the building in terms of scale, texture, detail, material, or ornament um, tend to be ones you can't fall in love with. And there are architects who would say that you're having an emotional attachment to their buildings are extremely unimportant. The one that comes to mind most immediately is Peter Eisenman, mm -hmm. who would be, you know, appalled by the notion that a building should feel good. I um, mean, I don't p think Peter would disagree with that comment. I should ask Dean Stern here whether he agrees with me or not. Um, but we we are firmly committed, and I think modern. You can love modern buildings. Mm -hmm. I think there 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 are many lovable modern buildings. I, I think you can love Bill Bow. Mm -hmm. um, I think Bill Bow is a very lovable building. I would say that I think experience, to love the Experiencing Music Project in Seattle is far more difficult than loving right. Bill Bow. Well, that's just because Bill Bow is better. I mean, uh, I, well, I, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> want to say that, but right. you know, I can it's, say it. It, it's easy to love mm -hmm. Philip Johnson's glass house. It's much harder to love a nondescript curtain wall glass building somewhere on, on, on Park Avenue where they destroyed a lovely church to build it, mm -hmm. um, or on 6th Avenue. Um, so 
no i don't think it's in that i don't think that any architectural style is inherently unlovable but i think you seriously have to can be concerned about a person's emotions i think that it's extremely unfortunate that many critics yourself excluded of course are much more interested in how buildings think because it's much easier to write about it's much easier to write about you know whether a building breaks the mold in terms of this that or the other thing um, it's very hard to write and be an intelligent sounding analytical critic about how things feel um, it's not fashionable to write about how things feel it's to write you know it's much more interesting to write about what are um, the, the, the the most interesting um, um, uh, intellectual trends um, I, I, I give a speech that, that looks at the elevation of low culture to high culture and for me one of the most greatest compliments I've ever had in my life is when I gave the speech in New York and Herbert Mouchamp got up and walked out. Um, <laughs> I thought that was a, a huge compliment. Um, you know, I, I think actually, uh, to pick up on, on what you said a moment ago, um, not Herbert Mouchamp, but Peter Eisenman, um, in fact, it, one always has an emotional reaction to buildings. Um, and in fact, uh, one has a very strong emotional reaction to Peter Eisenman's non-emotional buildings, in True. fact, do instill an emotional reaction. Um, uh, I, I think all buildings... Uh, I, I, we I, have, I, I uh, agree with that. Things, I think yeah, that people yeah. do have emotional reactions to all buildings. I think many architects don't create buildings that are geared towards people's emotions. And Peter's a good example. The systems behind Peter's buildings, the intellectual systems right. behind Peter's buildings are what matters to him, not how people feel about them. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, really, the, the, uh, the most successful buildings, and, and that's a term maybe too broad, but, but, well, put it this way. A great building, whatever that might be, a great building, though, I think must address and be successful in intellectual terms, mm -hmm. in emotional terms, and in terms of the moving center of, of how it how it works for people right. who use it, how it works for their bodies right. and their emotions and their mind. Yeah. And uh, you must address all of those things. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm always shocked when people take uh, architectural style as an ideology. Right. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm always in, infuriated. I'm amazed and infuriated as people uh, talk about a building that is done in a traditional style as somehow morally inferior or maybe morally wrong. Right. Uh, that you must, you must have something that has, uh, follows the idea that it's modern, whatever that may be, to, for it to accomplish high moral purpose. There's no role of that whatsoever in, in architecture, and you truly can accomplish great architecture uh, in modernist styles and in traditional styles. Uh, for me, for what I've uh, worked on for, for several decades in downtown Fort Worth, what works best for us for what we're trying to do in that context with those users, with the history that goes with it, with the way people perceive things emotionally and mm -hmm. intellectually, the traditional styles are really work, what, uh, what works best. Uh, but uh, if you take something like Disney Concert Hall, right. there in LA, in that kind of bizarre urban context of LA, that is an utterly brilliant building for all of its for all of its shortcomings that it has in some of the things of how you use it with your body, uh, there's no logic. Once you find the door, then there's no logic from there of how you're going to find your seat. But, but, but it is a, you know, you can overlook that. It is a truly brilliant, wonderful, inspiring, both intellectually, emotionally, mm -hmm. and, you know, when you, when you uh, get to the business of listening to a concert, Entirely functionally, yeah. uh, highly, highly it's successful. Extraordinary building. room to hear yeah. music in. I oh think. yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I think we should get Gary comment on that since we're 
drift, drifting into the subject of concert rise halls. You to that, you're out of your mind. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think Disney Concert Hall is a great building. I agree that there's no, there's no logic to it. You can't figure out where you're going when you go in the, in the main door. I think that the French fries for the organ are brilliant, actually. Um, one, the interesting thing to me about Disney Concert Hall, like the interesting thing in all concert halls for me, is the acoustic. And the acoustic in Disney Concert Hall is not warm. It's very high tech. And it's a little bit like a, you being inside the world's greatest electronic sound system. So you can hear everything. And so it's a wonderful place to hear Stravinsky. And I think it's a lousy place to hear Brahms. Um, and, and I think that it does have a relationship to the architecture. Mm -hmm. And there's also this whole theory or, or area of psychoacoustics, that it will sound the way it looks, and that if it's a warm looking environment, you'll hear warmth. And there's probably some truth to that. But, but I have to say the one thing that, that I want to mention about logic is that when we were looking for an architect for Severance Hall, we went to the ballpark in Arlington. And our little committee was a little grumpy because we were a little late and they were saying, why are we going to a ballpark? But the most brilliant thing that I've ever seen in any ballpark is how you've labeled the gates. The home plate gate, the first base gate, the second base gate, and so on. So everybody knows if you're sitting on the third base line or the first base line. And so in this ballpark alone, you know which gate to go in. That's the kind of building logic that I think is important to make somebody feel like they want to use it. And from commercial terms, even if you're an institution, make people feel like they want to go back. And it's so staggeringly simple, too. Yeah. Most, you know. most good things are simple. You know, it's interesting, and, and I wanted to make one point about Disney, which I think is interesting. Yeah. And I think this talks a lot about the appropriateness and the lack mm -hmm. of appropriateness of style. Bass Hall takes a, a maximum of 24 ushers to load. Mm -hmm. That's how many people it takes to get 2,000 people from the doors to their seats. The least number of ushers ever used at Disney Hall is 104. Um, to me, it's an, inter an extremely interesting t t yeah. statistic because the, I, I think it talks about the architecture. It certainly talks about operating costs. Um, I think one of the questions we fail to ask ourselves is at what price art? Um, the Atlanta Concert Hall was commissioned at this, actually it was six months before the Nashville Concert Hall was commissioned. Um, Nashville is finished and complete for a total cost of $98 million. Um, uh, Atlanta has not been started and the cost of construction is escalating more quickly than they're raising money. That's not a good sign for getting the building built. Um, and. I think that it is very easy to have all of these metrics on is Disney this, is Bass Hall that, but I think every client should know what they're buying. And if they're buying 104 ushers, that's great. I'm perfectly happy for them to buy them. Um, but you've got to be prepared to buy the 104 ushers. And know that it cannot work otherwise. That's right. You right, can't right, find right. your seat otherwise. I don't Which, but I don't think that's an, ec that's an economic thing for sure. But that actually speaks to the architecture and the relationship of the architecture to the public. Mm -hmm. Disney does not have the logic, and so it takes 100 ushers. Um, Bass Hall has logic, Severance Hall has logic, and so it's actually much easier to find your seat without an usher. Yeah, although, um, Gary, uh, Disney does have, um, while it doesn't have rational, easy, orderly logic, you know, it does have a sort of extraordinary presence that Absolutely. I think is not possible yeah. otherwise. And, and in fact, it, it really reminds me in that way very much of a building that I think it owes a lot to, which is not often enough credited, which is Berlin. But, you know, Berlin Where is, it's also very hard to find your seat. But no, I it's think not so easy to find your seat in Berlin either. I, I think Sorry. Berlin is much easier. It's really yeah. interesting because the entrance sequence in Berlin mm -hmm. is one that occurs symmetrically. And the, the, building ori the, the building does not work in a counterintuitive fashion. Okay. Whereas the interesting thing to me about Disney is you mm -hmm. enter at a very odd place in the lobby sequence, right. and you, you enter asymmetrically to the seating bowl. And, the, and that's a, a question of the site and I mean, lots of other things. 
But the the law, the, see Berlin, I think is an absolutely brilliant building. I do too. And, and yeah. one of the best One of the walls. most underappreciated great Absol buildings of the 20th century. I absolutely. Think. Yeah. But it does lead you. It, it, one of the most important mm -hmm. things about any concert hall is the, the first choice is right left. Yeah. There are basically four. The two main questions are right left up down. Right. That's it. And if you make those two decisions in a coherent fashion, getting to your seat's pretty easy. Things that's so difficult about Disney is right and left are very different. Um, and up is a questionable thing to do depending right. on where you're trying to go. Up right. doesn't necessarily get you to a seat that's up, it may get you to a seat that's down. Uh, and I think maybe I had trouble in Berlin because I don't speak German actually. <laughs> I don't know the words for up now. I, I want to mm -hmm. go to a little phrase Gary said, people, buildings that people want to use. And as simple mm -hmm. as that may sound, and, and to some people it may even sound trite, I think that really focuses on the, the, the most important and noble task of, of architecture, of building something, that buildings really must be approached that these are the purpose of a building is to serve people body mind and soul and that's an attitude that's not a style right uh, and I think that is something that is missing in much architecture uh, it's missing that attitude is missing uh, not infrequently in modernist architecture and maybe that's one reason to some people it gets a bad name. But it's missing in all styles of architecture and sometimes through sheer incompetence right. it's missing. Uh, but great architecture really takes that attitude of what its, uh, what its purpose is to deliver. And successful buildings, though they may be very simple, functional buildings, if people like to use them and people benefit from using them, profit from using them, enjoy using them, come back to use them. That's what we try to do in downtown Fort Worth, and that is really the central focus of, of what has made what we do successful. To some extent, we've, we've been able to make buildings that people like to use. That are, in effect, user-friendly. Right. Yeah, they like to use right. them. They, I mean, that's a, there's, a world, there's a world of complexity in those three little words, like to use, but mm -hmm. but you can really distill it down. And the whole built environment of a of a city, of a downtown, is not just the buildings. It's got to be the whole the whole built environment. You know, I also question the whole premise, uh, not only of style for the time, as as you've said, but the notion underlying it that it is not possible to be original in a traditional style, because in fact, really. Uh, traditional styles are languages within which you can say plenty of new things. This is, no? a, great, th this is a great city to ask that question. Um, we have, you know, two to three thousand years of history of architectural revivalism. Right. And one of the things that's particularly interesting about the city is we can see hundreds of years of Greek revival buildings right. without going very far. Um, all of them are different. All of them speak to their time. All right. of them. Um, really do um, are relevant to the moment in which they are built. You know, we have the Folger um, Deco building. We have the you know right. the, there there are lots of of, of different all the Federal Triangle buildings right. and so forth. Right. And, right. and so, I think the answer is that obviously the the, the notion that, that revival architecture is um, intellectually bankrupt to me is one that is intellectually bankrupt. Right. Because it's basically, you know, for 50 years now, we've rejected 3,000 years of architectural history. Um, I'd rather bet on the 3,000 years than on the 50 myself. Um, you know, it's interesting that you're saying that right now, because I, uh, this afternoon, I had a few minutes, and I was a little uh, closer to the Capitol, and I stopped in to see the Martin Puryear show at the National Gallery. And every time I'm in the John Russell Pope building, I'm blown away by how brilliant it is and how utterly and totally great it is, and in many ways how modern it is, too, Absolutely. in fact. Yeah. I mean, it's an extraordinary building. Paul, Paul yeah. me, where did we get this moral imperative to be innovative or original? 
I, it, that's at the root of it. This idea there's a moral imperative to be original. Uh, I think the moral imperative in architecture and in building is to be successful. Yes, but I would say, Ed, that great art and great architecture do have some responsibility to sort of push the art forward and push the culture forward a certain amount. Well, but what I was saying a moment ago is that one can still do that working within a traditional style. I mean, right. that was, say, what the National Gallery does. It does right. sort of push and, the art forward, and, and I think but without being, quote, modern. That, I, that, I, I think that's very important. We have a very limited view of what's original these days. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the National Gallery is a great example of a building that is wholly original. Right. And it has and a look at... Within that, a language that is traditional. And you right. can look that's at John Russell Pope's gas station on P Street, um, which is a neoclassical gas station, which is, again, wholly original. Um, and, you know, the, had you thought about doing a neoclassical gas station, most people would have said, well, you know, there is no such thing. Right. But the, the, there is such a, a notion that original has to be unrecognizable. Right. Um, and, and that's not, in fact, true. Um, and, and I think that's really a, a great unfortunateness. And the idea, I think, is, is made even, is blurred even further by the fact that, David, as you said earlier tonight, modernism is itself historical now. Right. So that, in fact, one can do modern buildings that are no more original than Greek Revival buildings Correct. today. And there are plenty of them that happen. So. Right. And, and right. many of them are being built. You know, if you look around Washington today, we right. have more 1960s Revival modernism going up here than any other single style. It's really quite stunning. But without any conscious and ironic intent right. to be Ex reviving. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. But, you right. know, something must have happened in the, in the, in, in the middle sort of middle 50 years of the 20th century. Because what, what we're talking about in terms of architecture also happened in music, mm -hmm. where, where the only intellectually, uh, the only intellectually sound music was music that no one wanted to listen to. Right. And that's changing again, and traditional forms are coming back a little more. But there was, there was the cult of the critic somehow in the middle of the 20th century declared that only if the music was pushing the envelope right. and only if it sent audiences away was that something that had any integrity. And there was nothing more horrible and violative of art than melody, right? I mean, you had a melody in music, that was like having a column capital in That's architecture or something. Exactly I mean, right. Same thing. Right, <laughs> right, you were finished. But in the 20th century, that really happened in all of the arts. Uh, uh, Robert Hughes called it the shock of the new. Uh, yes. that, that became the, the mode in the, in the art. In architecture, I, I have my own opinion of exactly when it happened. It happened with, in the 20s and 30s in Germany. It happened with the Bauhaus. Because there, was modern, there were modern trends in architecture uh, from from 1890 right, through, well, course, through to yeah. 1930 that were just, that, that we, we now look at as, uh, <laughs> as traditional. Uh, uh, the the, the, the uh, secessionist, uh, the modern, the, oh, of uh, the, the, the art nouveau, where the, the whole elaboration of the Baroque was, uh, there was finally this release and there was this great movement. It was the Bauhaus that threw out the baby with the bathwater. They said, we're throwing out all architectural history and we're going to approach this entirely uh, with this new, complete, clean slate. And, there were, and, 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 they were, and they were brilliant designers and they had fabulous workmanship and they built wonderful buildings. But then you try to imitate them around the world and you get a lot of mediocrity. It takes it, it takes it, it, in music and I guess also in architecture, it takes a genius to break the rules. If everybody else thinks they can break the rules and they're not a genius, you end up with a lot of bad results. Well, also, modernism, to get back to a theme that David uh, has been uh, articulating continually, uh, where modernism failed most egregiously was in urbanism. I mean, there was really no interest in the idea of urban fabric. Uh, it, there was, it was much more of a pure aesthetic than its rhetoric would have led you to believe. And one of the things that's really interesting to me is the, the, the people who have a... I don't consider myself to be a, a, uh, 
a new urbanist, uh, and I actually mm -hmm. fight the label. Um, and one of the things, that, but one of the things that is interesting to me, though, is modernists have not advanced an urban and a planning doctrine. They have not advanced a, a, a polemic on urbanism. And if you look at modern planning, if you look at Irvine, California, you look at uh, great pieces of White Plains, New York, you look at um, nobody has advanced a better paradigm right. than the traditional American urban environment. And so I think that, that modernism has gotten let off the hook and let off the hook in what I consider to be a most inappropriate fashion by not being asked to advance a polemic on urbanism. Um, and it's something that, 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 that they tend to shy away with. Sixth Avenue in New York is a perfect example to me of a modernist advancing of urbanism, which is entirely unsuccessful. Right, totally. And I'm just looking for one that works. Right, well, um, Siam sort of, Siam sort of tried to do that, but utterly unsuccessfully oh, yeah, also, exactly yes, right. yes. There are lots of examples. I mean, and of, there were, I mean there was Corbusier, there, were, there, were, there was Frank Lloyd. They all tried, but in fact, they, none of them got it. Brasilia. I right, mean, right, there are exactly, numerous right. attempts at modern polemics on urbanism. Unhappily, to my mind, they've all failed. Um, and I'm more than happy to embrace any one of them that works. David, we talked a moment ago uh, about John Russell Pope. Let me ask whether you think you work in the same sort of eclectic tradition of people like Cass Gilbert, Pope, uh, McKim Meaden White, James Gamble Rogers, Delano Aldrich, and so forth, or is there something different inherently about doing the kind of work that you do now in 2008? as opposed to 100 years ago or 75 well, years ago? No, I, you know, I, I would go back to, to, if I were to look for the, or, we, we, we have always called ourselves neo-eclectics. Okay. That is always the label we have chosen for ourselves. And I would go back to the likes of Blenheim Palace to look mm -hmm. for the origins of our work. Um, one of the things about some of your examples, a good example would be Mead, McKim, and White, right. um, is that they're fairly pure in their reinvention of style. We're not. We're happy to, to, to borrow from very diverse styles and put together things that wouldn't naturally go together. Um, and in ways I think we're very much like Schinkel. I mean, if you look at his concert. Or, or Lutchins. Or you know, Lutchins, right. right. right, right. That mm -hmm. We are perhaps very happy to, to borrow from any architectural period and recombine them in a way that is new and different. Blen Benham Palace is the first building I'm aware of that was so entirely irreverent in borrowing from anything that, that the architect happened to like and throwing it into the mix. Um, one of the other things I think that we believe is that architecture should have humor. Um, and if you, you, you become too studied in your architecture, you lose the humor. Um, when we did um, um, Sundance Square in, in, in um, downtown Fort Worth for Ed, we our piece of it, one of the things that we did is, and this is the first place we had, it, it looked at using salt glaze brick and um, flat brick to create ornament, so that what really creates ornament is the light rather than the brick. Um, and all of our ornament in that building is somehow based on longhorn cows. Um, and as the building moves around in the daylight and the cows light up and they go away, and it, it, it's really nice. And in the case of Gary, um, when we were, we, we love designing column um, um, orders. We, it's one of our favorite things to do for every building we try and invent a new order. You, 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 new, um, orders, you mean, new orders, you mean? New orders, yes. Okay. Yeah, new orders. And uh, we had the opportunity on the back of Severance Hall and that we had these series of columns we put on. Um, and there's a very under-recognized person in the history of, of Severance Hall, and that's a guy named Dudley Blossom. Because when John Severance died, the person who picked up the mantle was Dudley Blossom. Um, and so what we did on the back of the building was we inverted a treble clef to make a ionic capital. And then for the dentals in the ionic capital, we looked at Dudley Blossom's organ. Um, because we decided... Pipe some, organ. Pi You're right. Yeah. Pipe, <laughs> thank you. Um, pipe organ, correct. Um, and... It might have worked just fine. <laughs> I mean, is it... <laughs> He's dead, so... Right, right. <laughs> long since. Um, but I, I think it's this kind of reinvention and this kind of... Um, in a way, it's, it's a both a question of great reverence and enormous irreverence. Um, and I think what is singular about our work is the combination of the two. Mm -hmm. um, and well, I, that's I, an interesting point, to and, put and, it that way. Yes. And I think we, we, we have both, and we weigh continuously reverence and irreverence. Right, right, right. Who influenced you most among 
either living architects now or architects who were living when you were a student, let's say in your lifetime, as opposed to um, people from 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago? It's an easy answer, Charles Moore. Charles Moore. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the person who influenced my attitude about architecture from start to finish most completely was Charles Moore, and actually the second one would be Paul Rudolph, mm -hmm. um, who I worked for. Um, and it's interesting because Charlie taught me about irreverence, right? and he also taught me about reverence. Um, and he had his own way of employing both. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Rudolph said one thing to me which I'll never forget, which is, the best architect is he who wastes space best. Um, and if you are wasting space for no purpose, you're not a particularly good architect. So if you're going to waste space, do a really good job of it, and if you want to be great, do it really well. That's great. I think there is no better line on which to end, actually, than what you've just said. So, David, thank you very much for arranging all of this, really, this weekend. Gary and Ed, thank you very much for being part of it, and thank you for being here. We have a few more things happening this evening. David has very kindly agreed to sign his books here uh, at this table right here. And coincidentally, we ha happen to have some of those books in our store located right over here. <laughs> so that will be happening. The other thing is, you may have noticed these uh, monitors uh, at the back of the hall. And that is where you will be able to see the newly launched uh, video a virtual exhibition of David's work that was um, designed by architect Dean Sakamoto. It's a wonderful uh, uh, overview of David's work. Thank you all for a wonderful conversation. It was really terrific. And congratulations again, David, on your 30 years. Thank you.